Welcome everybody to the fourth Wine Communicators of Australia and the Australian Grape and Wine Authority webinar. This is our biggest one yet. We've got over 100 of you registered and uh, we're very happy to have you online today. My name is Anne Duncan. Uh, I work for the Australian Grape and Wine Authority and as a little bit of a background, AGWA is the amalgamation of Wine Australia and the Grape and Wine Research and Development Corporation. We invest in research and development for the wine industry and these wine, uh, I guess these webinars offer a great opportunity for us to provide the latest research findings to our levy payers. The research on which today's webinar is based is currently being undertaken by Johan Brewer at the University of South Australia. And to translate this research, we have um, Robin Shaw, who is the CE of the Adelaide Hills Wine Region, and Mark Dobson, who's the co-owner of Handorf Hill Winery, to discuss some of their insights in relation to cellar door success. And we'll be discussing today what is the value and are you missing out? Now, today we have, sorry, tech issue. So today, this is a webinar, so we want it to be interactive. We'd like you to start asking questions and there are multiple ways that you can use to ask these questions. Um, you can ask them in the comment box at the bottom of your computer screen just by tapping in a question. We've also got a Twitter handle, Winecom Australia, that we'll be looking at. Um, alternatively, we can email. So if you can email comms at winecommunicators.com.au and we will envisage, well, we'll try and, and answer those questions while we're online. Now, Robin is happy to be asked questions at any time. Um, so we'll start, we'll try and have a, a real conversation today. Without further ado, I'll pass you over to Robin Shaw. Hello, everyone. This is uh, fantastic to see so many people online today. I'm also happy to report that I've got uh, Mark Dobson beside me from Handorf Hill Winery in the Adelaide Hills. And Mark, uh, Mark and I have worked together, I think, for about the last uh, 10 or 11 years. That's right. Uh, I think Mark was one of the first people I ever spoke to uh, in my role at the South Australian Tourism Commission when we were looking at case studies for uh, what made a great wine tourism experience. And uh, Mark certainly uh, started off uh, answering that question very well and has evolved uh, his experiences over the years. So today Mark's going to uh, talk with us and help answer some of the questions uh, that we've got up on screen. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my background has been in the wine industry for the last 20 years or so. I've tended to specialise in wine tourism for the last 10 years, working with the Winemakers Federation of Australia and before that uh, with the South Australian Tourism Commission, but of course also uh, out there getting my hands dirty with uh, the Jacobs Creek Visitor Centre and some small wineries along the way. Um, over the last few years I've also done a lot of consulting with wineries all over Australia, mainly on uh, how to get the best out of their cellar door sales by training staff and uh, in a little bit of fun also taking people on uh, study tours to some of my favourite places in the world where wine tourism occurs best and those of you who know me know that that is South Africa. So of course there will be some references to some of my experiences overseas as well as around Australia today. Uh, as Anne said, please feel free to ask questions as we go along and uh, hopefully Anne will keep an eye on all of those and, uh, and put them to me and we can answer as we go. Um, the research today, uh, a lot of the slides that you'll see, which you'll get a copy of afterwards, are in reference to the research conducted by the University of South Australia uh, and Johan Brewer in particular. Uh, so I'll be referencing a lot of that. It's great to actually have these statistics available for us. The surveys have been conducted in your cellar doors around the country over the last uh, two years and they, the results are fantastic. Much of it is, is that which we already know but now we actually know it for sure and I think this sort of research is vital for us to continue to evolve our cellar door experiences. The really big question that we're asking today is how important is your cellar door really? And that's the question that we put to you and that's what I'd like you to focus on as we go through the slides. There will be questions for you to consider as we go through each slide and I encourage you to take some notes uh, and, and just take down your thoughts as we're talking here because uh, you'll find that those little uh, brainstorming moments will be very valuable later. So just before we move on, I'm going to hand uh, back over to Anne here. <laughs> we, um, we obviously have a lot of questions for you going through uh, Robin's presentation. 
but we have one major question for you, which is what role you play in your business? Now that question will be coming up on screen in the next couple of seconds because we'd, we'd like to better understand who we're talking to so we can start tailoring some of our ideas to our audience. Um, so if you, oh look, look at that, I'm getting poll, this is fantastic, it's almost election like. <laughs> um, so we're trying to see how many people are coming, we've got a lot from PR and marketing today and again from um, Again, winery owners seem to be fairly prevalent in our audience. So thank you so much um, for providing that information, guys. That will help us structure today's presentation. Now, without further ado, I think that um, that box is going to be shut down fairly soon. And ultimately, it looks like m the majority of our audience today are from PR and marketing and then winery owners. We've also got some cellar door managers, so it's nice to have you guys on board. Actually, it's great to see so many winery owners on board today. Uh, obviously, you're in the best positions to influence what actually occurs in your cellar doors and pass the information on to others. So great to see that there. All right. Yep, no, it looks like it's fairly, it's fairly stable. All right. So moving on, you've got the introduction and content, and now we get into the bulk of the presentation. <laughs> there we go. Okay, don't we love technology? Okay, so the first, uh, the first question for you is what is your ultimate cellar door goal? Over the years, irrespective of what people offer in their cellar doors, there seems to be one overriding reason as to why you have a cellar door at all. And basically that's to attract more people who consume more of your wine more often. And I had this little chat with Mark just before uh, we started and I said, uh, does that make sense? And uh, he was looking at me and I could see he was thinking about all the wonderful things that they actually offer at Harndorf Hill Winery. But when it really gets down to it, why you do all those things is simply because at the end of the day, we all need to be selling more of our wine more often and to more people. The research has shown us very, very clearly that a successful cellar door really can positively influence three key things. That is brand awareness direct sales, and of course the big question, future sales. Just getting cellar door sales on the day is terrific, but what we really want to do is build relationships with people so that they will continue to buy from us in the future, whether that means when they go back home or whether that means uh, directly from you. So think for a moment about what your primary cellar door goal is. And now let's have a little look through what I call the rosé coloured glasses. Uh, I did this exercise a couple of years ago at an Outlook conference and there's a series of questions that actually fit behind each of these elements here. And what I found is that most winery owners tend to view their cellar door through one of these primary lenses. So for someone who's looking at their cellar door as a sales outlet, they'll be looking to incorporate all sorts of uh, experiences, merchandise and activities that relate to getting more physical sales on the day. For those who are using their cellar doors mainly as a brand awareness vehicle, they'll be uh, doing different types of experiences that are designed to actually raise awareness of the brand. Then of course there are people who are primarily in the game of wine tourism. For people who are into wine tourism, they're looking at what they can do. They're looking at what, sorry, I'm being, being hand signals in here. <laughs> uh, they're looking at what they can do to actually attract more visitors uh, to the region and of course disperse them into the cellar doors. Then there are those who are into uh, hospitality, which is, uh, as we all know now, there are a lot of people who are incorporating functions, events, and even restaurant uh, activities uh, into their cellar doors. And then of course we have people who, for whom the cellar door and indeed making wine and growing grapes is their lifestyle. It's the life that they've chosen and they want to share it with as many people as they possibly can. So take a moment to consider which lens you currently use to view your cellar door business. There's no right or wrong answer here and most people would say it's a bit of a blend. And in fact I'm going to ask this question of Mark and uh, he can let you know how he looks at Harndorf Hill Winery. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with you that it's a blend. When I looked at the lifestyle one, I thought, well, it's actually too much hard work to be a lifestyle. But what um, Acelador does allow you, which would fit into that lifestyle section, is creativity. But it, one does have sales, branding, um, tourism. We probably have a little bit more of an emphasis on tourism because we're situated in a tourism village. Um, and so we see all our activities through that um, filter. Fantastic. So why do people actually come and visit Saladors? There's been a lot of research done uh, over the last decade or so to find out what actually motivates people to visit Saladors. Now, I've taken a look at all of that information and distilled that down to seven major motivating factors. And I know a lot of you sort of go, okay, I only want people to come to my cellar door who buy wine. And I hear that all the time. However, the people who actually come to your cellar door don't necessarily want to buy wine on the day. They do, however, know that you are a winery and the primary purpose is, of course, to come and taste some wine. And that is, in fact, the number one reason why people come to a cellar door. However, if you have a look at the seven factors there, you'll see that there's about five of them there that don't have very much to do with wine at all. These are what I call the sub-motivating factors, the reasons why people choose to take a day out, whether that means that they're going out with family or friends or uh, indeed to learn a bit, bit more about wine. But it's all of these other elements that are actually really crucial to how people perceive the experience and whether they will actually turn that into a positive buying experience on the day. So have a think about the sorts of things that you're doing to help people achieve these additional sub-motivating factors. How can people relax at your place? Are you offering them opportunities where they can sit back with their family and friends, uh, enjoy the views? What sort of, not that we're in the game of entertainment particularly, although I have heard it said that uh, Salvador is all about the theatre, but what sort of things can they do to entertain themselves? Are you geared up for family? Are you geared up for larger groups or small intimate groups? What other sorts of opportunities do people have to engage with you? Often there are people who are being dragged out for the day who don't necessarily have a great interest in wine. What other activities can they do with you? What other arts, crafts, produce and merchandise do you have? Mark, what sort of things do you do to uh, help your guys relax? Uh, we have um, Chocobino, which I know you're going to talk about later, and we um, have pe people can relax with a glass of wine or a wine flight and have a platter or a cheese plate. Um, we don't have any grassed, beautiful grassed areas outside our cellar door, so it's really all inside, but we make the most of what we've got inside and they can just chill out there. And, and just to get back to what you were saying about um, people not always coming you know, to buy wine, I remember you telling me that uh, eight years ago, and I've always borne that in mind. So it's, and, and it's absolutely true because the people are coming in, in, come in a group of four, maybe two of them will be interested in wine and the other two will probably just want to sit and have a coffee or have a cheese plate and maybe a glass of wine. But they're not, their primary purpose is not really to come and learn about wine. Actually, one of the things that's great about your place, Mark, as well, is your winery dogs, which, uh, right, yeah. which uh, <laughs> come and greet people. And I, I do remember bringing my, my children to Handel Hill Winery some years ago. And you must have had some grapes on the vines there too, because I've got a fantastic photo of, uh, of my son when he was about 12 with the dog uh, by his feet while he's picking some grapes uh, just there in the vineyard. It's actually amazing how um, the public bond with the dog, because... People come back five years later and ask about the dogs, but the dogs are now 12 years old. So, um, yeah, there are not many years left, but that is um, definitely, a, you know, if we're talking about um, sales being based on relationships, people bond with your dogs at your cellar door, definitely. So, who's, who's actually visiting you? Um, according to the research, and I'm not sure if you guys can see the next, oh, there we go, there's the next slide. Fantastic. Um, so according to the research, the majority of people who actually visit cellar doors, and that's nearly 60% of them, are highly influenced by their visit, but they're also first timers. So we get, uh, this, and this particularly holds true for wineries who are a little more remote. They'll get more of a percentage of first time visitors than others. Um, maybe a, a little question for you all to uh, answer, what's your experience of the number of first time visitors that you get versus repeat visitors? Obviously we all want repeat visitors, but we don't necessarily all get them. 
the research tends to tell us that in reality we've only got a 50-50 chance of seeing the same visitor again. Now that's also because people live remotely, if they're travelling around and they're on holidays, they won't necessarily have a chance to get back to see you again. Which means we also need some strategies in place to ensure that we can maintain the communication uh, post-visit. So the key to doing that of course is to develop a loyalty program and get people to uh, communicate with you regularly and we'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, the other thing that's really important that came out of the, uh, the research is that people don't stay for very long in your region, if they stay at all. The majority of visitors are actually day trippers and that holds true from research we've done over several years where the majority of visitors to pretty much any cellar door in Australia generally come from within a couple of hours of the cellar door. Now I know for you guys down in Margaret River uh, and uh, Rutherglen and some of the uh, further remote places, uh, that doesn't hold true but for the majority it certainly does. It, there's also another interesting statistic which I thought was uh, a good one. 15% of all your visitors will probably come from within your region. These are likely to be the people who have uh, visiting friends and family but also local businesses. And this also poses a challenge. If you're going to have people continually revisiting you, what are you doing to refresh the experience so that they actually uh, get a new experience themselves each time? Often I found, especially working around the Barossa, that there was a, a lot of people would bring their friends and family to come to um, the well-known brands, the well-known places, and occasionally they'd step outside the comfort zone and find a new place. But the important thing for those places that uh, are traditionally getting friends and family visiting them, what are you doing to make that a, a new and refreshing experience each time those people come through? Do you do anything in particular, Mark? I'd that? actually say that sometimes they don't necessarily want something new every time. What they're probably looking for if they're coming back for a return visit is a familiarity of um, going to the cellar door and they know the cellar door person, they know what they're going to expect. Um, having said that, there are some people that will want you to have a new wine or you know a, a new chocolate or something new. Yes, yeah, so it, it works both ways. Yeah, I think that familiarity um, is, a, is actually a really important point. People will take people back to places because it's, because it's safe and they know pretty much what they're going to get. Um, I'm not sure how many of you actually sign people up to mailing lists but uh, in my experience there's a lot of mailing lists out there that uh, don't seem to get used very often. Um, I can't tell you the amount of times I've been out to sell it all, signed up for a mailing list and actually never been communicated with again. If we actually want to maintain relationships with people it's really, really important that we start that communication and we start it straight away. I'll talk to you a little bit later about how often you should communicate with people um, according to the research at the very least. So people are actually out there talking about you. What are they actually saying though? That's, that's the critical question. It's great to have people talking but we need to actually influence what they're going to say to other people. We know from the research that a positive cellar door visit really does influence consumption behaviour and can change a visitor's attitude. And that holds true for people who have been aware of your brand before they come and visit you as well as those who just happen to find you uh, on the day. The great news is that word of mouth still rules. I know we've been to a lot of digital marketing seminars over the last few years and there's a nice new term called word of mouth. That's fantastic, but guess what? Face to face is still the primary way that people will communicate with each other. Apparently 83% of visitors, according to the surveys that were done, will recommend wine from cellar door that they've visited. They'll tell at least three different people post visit about your wine. They'll actually talk to people face to face and on the phone. And even though they will use social media and Facebook is the leader there, it's really only a very small minority who will make recommendations that way. Mark, have you done any research about how people are communicating about you? Um, usually when we ask at the testing counter, how did you get to hear about us? It's through um, uh, someone I know that said, oh, you must, if you're going to other hills, you're going to Handorf, you must go to this particular winery. So I would also definitely put word of mouth um, right there at the top. Great. What about uh, referrals and recommendations? Uh, that's also very important. You mean recommendations from other cellar doors? Other cellar doors, yeah. yes. Well, when we opened our cellar door, one of the first 
and best pieces of advice I ever got was from a government booklet um, in Canberra and they said um, in their um, opinion and from their research um, if you recommended um, your visitors to go to the neighbouring set of doors that would pay huge dividends for you and we did that right from the start and in the 10 years since we've been open there are now quite a few set of doors in our area and all the set of doors in our area really work well together so um, we don't view each other as competition, we're collaborating and it makes sense because they might come to our cellar door and buy a Sauvignon Blanc and a um, Zunavotnina but they want a Pinot Noir so we can say well around the corner there's Nepenthe, they have a fantastic uh, Pinot Noir, go there, we want a great sparkling, go to Summerled in the main street of Handorf. so um, collaborating with other businesses um, is um, yeah, great. Excellent, it really does work. So think about uh, who you can collaborate with in your region, not just the other cellar doors, although they will be your primary source of referral business, but also other local businesses. Interestingly, retailers' recommendations are also quite strong. So wherever you're selling your wine out in the trade, make sure they're educated about where you are uh, so that they can make the, the relevant recommendations as well. As far as printed material goes, wine guides that are relevant to regions are utilised quite heavily. Uh, and maps are also another thing that people want to use uh, a lot. Much and all as we have GPS on our phones and uh, all these wonderful apps, people still seem to like having uh, something tangible, something that they can actually draw on, write on and turn upside down in the car. So one of the thoughts that came up was, uh, well, why don't we just treat everybody like they're from the media? Because if you've got media visiting, you're very particular about what it is you say to them because you know that they're actually going to write an article about you or conduct an interview or say something on the radio. So what if we thought about our visitors in, in that perspective as well and went, okay, what can we say to our visitors that we want them to repeat to others? Can I just interrupt? That's a very sure. valid point, Robin. And uh, we get a lot of media that gets sent to us by the South Australian Tourism Commission, but they send the, they send the media to us because they know that we treat each and every person as if they were media. Ah, yeah, cool. so they all get the same experience is that they get the same um, focused attention and, um, and good, good customer service. So have a think about what it is that you want your visitors and other referrers to say about you. Have you got something written down that your staff are aware of? What sort of training have you got in place? So consider carefully the message that you want sent. Right, we're move, moving on to another slide now. No, we went, oh, yep, there we are, that's it. So here's a headline for you. Up to one third of visitors don't buy wine. Five out of seven motivating factors don't involve wine and only half your visitors will ever return. Sounds a little bit uh, sobering but obviously we can influence that. We know we can influence that. And the way that we do that is what I call the essential three E's. We need to entertain our guests. The way we entertain them is through an experience that's so memorable that it elicits an immediate and hopefully favourable response. I've got lots and lots of stories of some fantastic experiences uh, from around the world. There's a, there's a little photo up on screen there that says, our trees tell stories at Van Loveren. Van Loveren is a cellar door in the Robertson region of South Africa. And they've got a fantastic uh, story about their tangled trees. And Tangle Tree is also the name of uh, one of their, their major wine brands. But the Tangle Tree is a love story. It's the story about uh, the, the husband who buys a tree for his wife, thinking it's the same as another one that uh, he has planted uh, on the property that she absolutely loves, but is, uh, the tree is actually dying. So he orders another tree and plants it next to the tree that's there and it's completely different. And this tree ends up uh, growing and tangling in with the one that they thought was dying, which didn't. And there's a beautiful tangled tree uh, in the garden. The, uh, the owner of the property was, uh, loved her trees and loved her, her plants. And uh, they've actually set up a, uh, a tour through the, through the trees and through the gardens. And it's a fantastic opportunity for people to engage. They've also got bike tracks and, uh, and other tours and, and attractions on the property. It's very much about uh, telling the story. 
have a think about what is your story and how you tell that story to people. How do they actually experience that at your cellar door? And what can you get them to do that's actually going to be memorable on the day? Mark, what do you do to really convey your story? Well, our story actually was thrust upon us because when we bought the farm, there were two options um, German grapes growing there, which we'd never heard about, Trollinger and Lemberger. Lemberger is also known as Blaufrankisch. And uh, we decided to make a rosé from it. So we made a, uh, a dry style rosé, which was unusual 10 years ago. And then we noticed that all the um, attention or publicity we got was actually for the rosé um, uh, in the beginning rather than the other wines. And we worked out it was because it had a point of difference. It was different. So we've just worked with that point of difference ever since then and all our decisions are, that we make are how can we um, differentiate our offerings so that it's unusual and it can attract people and um, that led us to um, you know, having Austrian variety wine and to Chocovina. So there are lots of cellar doors that match chocolate to wine but no one does it the way that we do it based on terroir, that's our point of difference. Fantastic. So think about what genuine memorable experiences you offer. What is it that people are going to take away and how can you get them to be engaged with you? Converting people is critical if we're going to attract more people to spend more wine more often with us. Sales on the day are actually critical. We know that people who buy wine at cellar door are more likely to purchase again in the future. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, it doesn't really matter if they don't buy wine from us today. Hopefully they'll have had a good enough experience and they'll go and buy it somewhere in the future. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Experience tends to show that if people don't actually have something tangible in their hands on the day, they'll probably forget about you. This holds true in retail as it does in, in many other sectors as well. Certainly from experience, uh, and, and many of you will, will have heard this before, when you ask people late in the day at the cellar door, so where have you been today? And they say, oh, uh, uh, we went to a few. Um, can you remember which one? Oh, there was that one with the dog. We liked that one. That was, that was, that was good. Can you remember the name of the winery? Um, uh, what's it? Can you remember the name of it while they, while they talk to each other? Without another prompt, in their hands when they get home, when they open up the box and go, ah, now I remember which wineries I went to because I put their wine in the car, you've got much less of a chance of actually engaging with them in the future. I remember speaking with uh, Ross Brown some years ago uh, when we were doing a lot of this research and he came up with a fantastic line, sales are the outcome of the experience. The better the experience, the more sales you'll actually get, both on the day and in the future. So everything that we do in a cellar door really must revolve around the experience itself. Of course, it's people who actually create those experiences and create those lasting memories. In a cellar door, we're engaging with people for anywhere from half an hour to a couple of hours and sometimes an entire day, depending on what it is that you've got going on. So it's really important that your people, your staff, are all trained up to engage, be hospitable, but most importantly as well, to be able to sell. Selling is not just a function of uh, needing to move wine and needing to make profit. We know that that needs to be done. Selling is actually winding up the relationship. It's, uh, it's the full circle. It's from inviting people in the door, involving them into experience, uh, through the experience, and then asking them to maintain a relationship with you by, uh, by buying some wine or another experience from you. How do you go, Mark, with, uh, with your staff on that? Well, first of all, just to comment what you said earlier about um, some cellar doors saying oh, it's really not that important if they don't buy, um, I, I would say that actually it's very important, especially in today's economic environment when staff costs are so high. You actually have to sell. Um, you can't guarantee that you'll make a sale each time, but um, we usually have an 80% um, success rate at the tasting counter. We monitor every sale um, against every person that comes, whether it's a box of wine or merchandise, so we can track trends. Who's, what, on what days do people you know, buy more, etc. And then in terms of sales skills, what you and I were talking about earlier, one can um, get staff trained in everything except sales. And there's, there's nothing out there that will train Cellador um, staff to sell wine, so we train them ourselves. 
um, um, backed up with information we have got from you in the past when I've been to workshops of yours. Um, and we pick our staff really carefully. I don't hire staff for their wine knowledge. I don't care if they know nothing about wine. I hire them for their people skills, for their ability to be kind and sensitive and engaging and warm. I can always teach them about wine, but I can't teach them to be um, emotionally intelligent. That's very difficult. So, and if I have to teach them about wine, I only have to teach them the general principles of wine and my wine. They don't have to know about a Pinot Noir because we don't sell one. So the task is much easier if you have to teach them about wine rather than if you hire them because they've got amazing wine skills and then try and teach them to have excellent customer service. So we've got a question just, oh, we've actually got three questions, but I'll focus on the one, one question at a time. So we've got um, a question uh, talking about price and or, or there being a special deal and, how, and the importance um, of price or a special deal in the eventual sale. Do you find that price matters if you have a two for one special that you get more sales um, or is it purely staff? We don't offer um, special deals at the tasting counter. Uh, we only offer them special deals to people that sign up to our loyalty program. And I'd say there again that Celadors really c can't afford to offer too many special deals. Again, because it's very expensive to run a Celador with staff costs and everything else. So we sell wine based on the relationship between the person on the other side and our staff and the warm bond that is created and just little touches, you know, greeting them, um, giving them a glass of water when they come in, if they've got children putting out a box of toys if the children are entertained, just showing that we care and that helps facilitate the sale. Do you have a sales script? Your no, staff? we specifically don't have a sales script because then it sounds artificial. We train our staff to listen so that they are listening to the customer and throwing that conversational tennis ball back and responding um, sincerely. So it really is about staff training and getting the right staff member in the first instance. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now Clayton um, has a question just online. He's asking what is the best way to track visitors versus sales per visitor? So how do you track? You said that you're looking at trends in, in sales per visitor. Is there a program that you use? Oh, we do. It's called Citadel Metrics. It's a fantastic program. And there used to be a lot of wineries that used to join up um, to it. And then after the global economic crash in about 2009, wineries started dropping off. And I think it was because they were too depressed to put in their <laughs> sales figures. But it's a very valuable tool. We, we count um, visitors in terms of groups. So we'll say one group, four people, and then how many people buy in that group. And then we input our figures into Celador metrics. And we, that enables us to track data. It's actually uh, a critical point, isn't it, Mark, because you really can't manage what you don't measure. Depending on the size of your cellar door, of course, you can use different methods to track the number of visitors, whether that's uh, people counters um, and get a bit of a feel for it that way, then look at the, the number of transactions and make some uh, quality assumptions based on that. If you're a really small cellar door, you can literally track just about everything and I really highly recommend that you do. Um, whether it's manually, uh, in terms of numbers of visitors, where they've come from, how much they purchased, you'll be amazed at how quickly you can actually build up a database of uh, information, uh, especially around referrals and things like that too. Uh, I used to do it at a tiny cellar door. Yes, there was plenty of time on my hands. But it, what was interesting about doing that over a, a few months is that I could uh, gauge that, okay, I'm selling to an 80% to 90% conversion rate that the average group size is, uh, is four, that people come from a particular area, so I could focus the marketing there, and of course, uh, who was doing the major referring. That, that's really critical to know as well. Exactly. All right, so say we move on, and let's start pulling up a seat for our guests. So this is, this is often a contentious uh, little issue here. Do you want your guests to sit down or do you want your guests to stand up? And I know that uh, this, this usually divides the room in terms of uh, do you have a taste encounter where people come in and they stand or maybe potentially perch at a stool or do you sit them down and do seated tastings? 
Now, depending on the amount of resources you've got available, you may say, well, we can only service people standing at the bar because we get too many people through. I would contend that uh, irrespective of the size of your cellar door, there are ways where you can actually get people to sit down. But why do you want people to sit down in the first place? Well, there's a bit of research uh, out of uh, the US that says that seated tastings generate nearly 22% greater average purchase per visitor. This is just versus standing up at a bar. I'm not talking here necessarily about special, um, special experiences. This is really about uh, sitting down to have tastings versus standing up at a bar. And I guess you use the restaurant analogy. You don't go out for dinner and sit down, uh, sorry, and stand up uh, while you're, you're at a restaurant. And the reason you don't do that is because you're there for quite a long time and it's very uncomfortable. And yet, of course, we do this in our cellar doors. We put the barrier between us and our guests. And it really does play an important factor in whether you're going to keep people there for a long time and help create that relationship. I think another thing worth noting there is that wine club conversion rates nearly doubled when customers were seated. I'm trying to figure out exactly why that happened. I imagine that's because they've actually got the time to sit there and read through material and actually sign up. Mm. Would you think that would be the right answer? Yeah. I don't know the reason, but I thought it was interesting statistics. Uh, what I do think, you think, Mark? I think, Robin, if people are actually seated, they are relaxing and therefore they're connecting emotionally better with the brand and the environment. Um, but we do both seated tastings and um, tastings at the at the tasting counter. There is an argument for tasting to the tasting counter because when you're very busy, it a, it's a, has allows a greater flow and you can process the sale and they, those people move off and then you can get a new wave of people. Because the people that are seated could stay there for several hours and you, know, <laughs> you want them to bond, but they are blocking up tables. I'm just talk, putting on my ha own winery mm -hmm. with hack. So both have their place. Um, out of those, uh, it'd be interesting just to get a bit of a stat on the on the uh, comments there as to how many people do seated tastings versus uh, stand up tastings. We'll wait for those. We'll wait for some of your participation. So if you wouldn't mind just tapping into that box on the lower right, lower left hand side of your screen, then just tell us how many people have seated tastings and how many focus on that on that stand up tasting. We'll keep moving through because now we're actually looking at tasting wine. This well, seems to be the primary purpose of going to a cellar door, but yeah. maybe it's not. Well, the, the research really does say that yes, people are there to taste and buy wine. Thank God for that. One of the contentious things though is that uh, how exciting is it to actually go to cellar doors and taste wine? And I often hear that wine tastings can be quite boring. Which is no. not what would you take hand, you that can be very boring. You shock me. I'm glad I'm sitting down. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is why are they boring? I guess the feedback says they're repetitive. You get the same spiel everywhere you go. You know, hi, how are you today? Want to try some wine? I don't know how many times I've heard that going into cellar doors. It's also a case of tell. People are being talked at as opposed to having genuine interaction. And as Mark said earlier, it's all about uh, creating that, that tennis, tennis match environment of uh, questions and answers. And in fact, Asking lots of questions is the key to creating a great relationship and of course eliciting some sales. The range can also be quite overwhelming in a lot of cellar doors. People want to show all of their wines. I don't know about uh, a lot of you, but when I go to particular regions, I'm really interested in what that region itself has to offer. So I don't necessarily want to try all of the wines from a particular brand. I want to try what that region is about. But more often than not, people will try and Give me the wine at the start and take me through to the end. And I don't have the time necessarily or the inclination to do that. Do you find that, Mark, that people want to just uh, try Sauvignon Blanc or just want to try some varietals or do you try and take them through everything you've got? Mm. How, do, how do you structure that? Well, we don't have many wines on um, tasting, maybe about six, but we ask them uh, what would they like to taste. So we put the um, power back in their hands and then some will taste all and then some will only um, taste what they want. But it also does allow for conversation as you said. Mm. You, um, can, you, you, you guide it by what they say. We had a question from earlier that asked of the importance of having things that were available or wine products that were available only at the cellar door. What do both of you think about that, that to have to offer your customer or your consumer something that's available only at your cellar door? Is that important? 
Absolutely. I think that would be uh, important um, because it would make them feel special. Uh, we don't have that because um, whatever we have is available wherever. Um, but I, I do know of set of doors that do that very successfully. Yeah. I remember um, Ian Hollick said years ago about uh, his experience down at uh, Hollick's in Kunawara and he said that the uh, uh, Salador only lines were the most profitable and the most successful. And the reason for that was because you've got a captive, captive audience and you say to people, well, look, this is, uh, you can't get this anywhere else. Yes. Salador only. And you know, I would argue even at some of the, uh, the larger places where I've worked over the years, if you've got a wine that's maybe a back vintage, um, something uh, that's a bit different, uh, and it's cellar door only and not available out in retail, that's a genuine point of difference. Because of course, you can get the argument from people in a cellar door, oh look, I can, I'll go home and buy it. And okay. uh, <laughs> that's usually a fair fee, they won't necessarily go home and buy it. Actually, it's a very valid point which people often ask, is your wine available in the liquor stores? And uh, we can say quite honestly, it's only an independent, small independent, it's not available in the big ones. Uh, but they are sometimes looking for an opportunity, oh, well, I'll buy it there. So um, if one had something that was or special, one would also be able to price it um, differently, which is also an advantage. As you were talking, I realised that myself, I thought that's something I've got to look into. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> um, while we're actually talking about differenti differentiating the wine tasting experience, um, we had a little conversation earlier about uh, whether to charge or not to charge for tastings. <laughs> and Mark, uh, in, in the past you haven't charged for your standard tastings uh, at the bar. You obviously charge for your special experiences. Um, are you changing that philosophy at all? Well, we actually introduced pay tastings at the tasting counter about 10 days ago. And um, I've been wanting to do it probably for about three or four years now. But uh, it's taken that time for me to get up my nerves because it is a contentious <laughs> issue. But um, it's worked extremely well. And I think the reason I could do it with such confidence and ease of mind is that 90% of the cellar doors in our tourist region, uh, Handorf, are now charging. And um, the reason they're charging is because, well, I keep reiterating this, it is very expensive to run a cellar door. And what the um, charging does, it does filter out people that might just be looking for something to do. And uh, they, they, you know, you might have a large group come in and um, only two people want to really taste wine. So they won't taste the wine now, but they'll go and have a coffee or they'll go and do a chocolatino experience. So I'm very happy with charging. What, what do you charge? We charge $5 per person and it's redeemable if they make wine, any wine purchase. Okay, and have you had any pushback from repeat visitors who have perhaps been visiting you for years? Uh, no, we did have someone yesterday that said that they recently bought two cases online and does he still have to pay? And the settlement manager made the judgment call very nicely that unfortunately he did still have to pay. So, um, yeah. We're still uh, working it out as we go along. Hmm. And from our um, feedback, it looks like around about the $5 mark is what other, other cellar doors are operating at. And some of them uh, are saying that they only charge on their premium range and some of them only charge in groups or four groups and then quite a few it is redeemable with purchase. Hmm. So it does look like it's an idea that's filtering through the industry as, as an option. Yeah. I just want to say that, um, for example, on a Sunday when a casual um, staff, a set of staff at the tasting counter will be earning over $40 mm -hmm. an hour, mm -hmm. you just cannot afford um, not to charge or not to sell sufficient wine because you'll be operating at a loss. So it, it does help. It, it, and also, I think it sends out a subliminal message that I, as a winery, I am confident enough of the quality of my wines and the quality of my experience to charge. And um, that message is absorbed. Because we have noticed it's just a subtle difference in the interaction. It's positive. So I'm very happy with it. Mm. I think it's actually a really interesting point because uh, as an industry <laughs> for, for so long, we've, uh, we haven't valued the fact that uh, of our, our, our wine tastings. And that, that isn't just in the cellar doors. That's also out in the trade when we do consumer events. Um, we don't charge. And yeah. again, are we sending the right messages? 
I've just been given uh, that, that we have to move on. We're obviously talking too much here. So let's, let's move through the slides so we'll actually have some chance for you to ask questions at the end. So uh, the uh, natural follow-on from uh, a wine tasting is, of course, um, to have a little food with it. A few years ago, uh, I did a, a benchmarking survey program up in Queensland and uh, it just came back overwhelming evidence that if there was any kind of food involved in the tasting, the satisfaction levels uh, went through the roof. So when I say food, I don't mean full-on restaurant. You don't have to have a full-on restaurant to have a food experience. In fact, some of the feedback that came from this uh, particular program was that if there was just even some, uh, some crackers on the counter, some olives, some nibbles of any kind, that value added the experience so much that people purchased wine, stayed longer. Such a very, very simple thing and yet we don't do enough of it. And I know Anne and I have spoken uh, over the last few years about uh, corporate social responsibility, which oh, is yeah. one of Anne's uh, catch cries. And I would argue that we, we actually do have a bit of an obligation to ensure that people aren't just drinking wine. And I know we have responsible service, yep. but I wonder if uh, there's a little bit further we can go with that. And what, how have you been going with that? Uh, listen, it's also, about, it's also about branding wine. It's about saying that wine goes naturally with food, that it's naturally involved in a convivial experience, that it's not just an alcoholic drink, that what we pair wine with matters. It's about educating our consumer about how to drink our product in a responsible way, yes, but also in the way that it was supposed to be supposed to be um, be drunk. Um, so that's that's definitely you are right. That is a, mm -hmm. a, an idea that is very dear to my heart. Um, but also, I'm looking at it from a consumer point of view and think I have a much better experience and a richer experience when I do have a cracker in between the two wines that I'm tasting. So I get a better understanding of what that second wine tastes like. It's, it's just an experience that sticks in my head a little bit more. Um, so just as a consumer, not even talking about CSR, it's one of those things that I appreciate. Mm. Obviously, from a winery perspective, if you've got local produce in particular, and it's a great. You can also, you can yep. also sell it. So then you start selling, selling your region, important. and yep. you start selling your region, and you start selling the value-added product. Absolutely, yes. So let's move on to uh, hear a little bit more from Mark about the actual Chocavino experience that he's been alluding to, because it is truly one of the uh, most remarkable uh, experiences that I've seen uh, in cellar doors in Australia. Thank you, Robin. Um, well, Chocovino was really, we were looking for something that was, um, would just give us a point of difference. And as I said earlier, other set of doors do, do chocolate and wine and do it very well. So we, but we decided to work with the phenomenon of single origin chocolate and use um, that kind of chocolate as a metaphor to um, teach people about wine. So we, so we call it infotainment. It's information mm -hmm. but presented entertainingly. And people are sitting there and relaxing, and they and they walk away with an understanding of the Adelaide Hills terroir, of an understanding of how to taste wine because there are similarities in the terminologies of wine and gourmet chocolate, um, and they've learned something new. And it's been a tasty um, um, exercise. Um, it does help us sell wine, um, and uh, it also gets us um, a lot of publicity, which helps drive people to the cellar door. So that point of difference is always a driver for um, um, other uh, factors that um, boost sales. Mm. Yeah. So Mark, I, I know there'll be a lot of people uh, listening who uh, are maybe thinking about going down the track of setting up a, a cafe or a restaurant, and you've been down that track. We have. We actually had a restaurant which operated on weekends, and Larry, the other owner of Honda Fiorani, was the chef, and then when we... Um, uh, doubled our vineyard when we were planting uh, the Grunewald Lina, it was just his workload had tripled. Um, having a restaurant is only for the brave, I must <laughs> say that straight out, because it's a whole new industry and a whole new set of skills. So when we closed the restaurant, when each, I, I closed it, because I said to Larry, you're just working too hard, I wanted something that I could use seven days a week that every single member of staff could do. And so I implemented Chocobina, and Chocobina went uh, well and continues to go well. In the last couple of years, people have asked, have you got a platter? Because in the beginning, we didn't, I went right off food. 
And um, people have asked, you know, we want, as Anne has been saying, they want to sit there and relax with food. So again, I, I didn't want to be reliant on one person. So all the staff are trained to be able to use the coffee machine, to be able to make the cheese plate, and to be able to assemble the platters. And so we have savory, um, seafood, vegetarian, and a cheese plate. But there again, even that food at a simple level, I must say, um, does involve protocol and uh, you know, you've got um, compliances. So I haven't brought this up before, it's the perfect time to bring it up. I, my strongest recommendation I would make to any cellar door owner who wants to make a real go of it is to get tourism accreditation. It's the one thing that has really helped me. We have about 30 or 40 cellar doors in our region and only five have tourism accreditation and it really puzzles me. In a big region like the Barossa, I think they're only 10. Because what tourism accreditation does, it gives you all the systems and templates to train your staff and for your staff to operate at optimum level. Yeah, that, that is a really good point. That's about the professionalism behind cellar doors. So in South Australia, it's the South Australian it's Tourism the, Industry Council that, that runs it, and they have equivalents in every state. So you can certainly get hold of that information, or we can provide that for you later as well. So we know that people uh, actually want to purchase wine. Uh, in fact, uh, around up to three quarters of visitors, visitors will actually spend money on wine and spend about 80, 80 or 90 dollars and take away about four bottles. Do you find that average holds for you, Mark? Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily four bottles all the time. Um, maybe it just depends on the uh, price of the average. wine, yeah. Yep. But as I say, 80% of people will buy at the tasting counter, yeah. Some will buy a case, some will buy two bottles, yeah, it depends. Uh, part of the, the research that was done was to track whether people followed up and purchased uh, back in the trade after their visit to the cellar door. So it's fantastic to report that over half of the people who were surveyed and visited the cellar doors uh, purchased an average of five bottles each in the six months post visit, which is fantastic. Um, However, there's about 40% of visitors who don't know where they can purchase wine at retail. And Mark, you made a point earlier of letting people know that the, uh, your wine is available only through the independents. The question is, do all your staff know exactly where your wine is available? Because that's, that's a key to actually having people uh, purchase later. We know that 60% of cellar door visitors will go and purchase uh, through the retail chains. Um, so do your staff know where your wine's available. What do you do to ensure your staff know? Well, we put our retail outlets, the independent retail outlets, on our website. Mm -hmm. um, we would like people to buy um, from the retail outlets because they are customers of ours, but ideally we'd like them to buy online directly from us. So our, for the first um, port of call would be the staff would say, here's a um, mail order form, or sign up to our loyalty program and we'll send you an email and you'll get a special offer four times a year. Fantastic. So moving on to wine clubs, that's a really important point. There's obviously a whole heap of different wine clubs and we're not going to go into that today because we really don't have the time. The point I will make is that wine club members are really important people. They're the ones who are going to purchase your wine now and in the future. They're always higher spenders when they visit. And interesting to note that the average length of membership in Australia is about 26 months and when I compared that with the US figures, it's almost identical. And that's actually crept up over the last few years. So I remember doing this, uh, looking at US figures about 10 years ago and it was about 18 months. So people are staying in clubs longer. Do you find uh, people are staying in your clubs for a longer period of time than previously? Uh, I would say that people would probably stay a couple of years and then you know they fall in love with another set of doors yeah. and they go there. It's normal. Yeah. Um, the, the most important thing is you have to keep that set of door, uh, new people flowing in, yeah, fresh, yeah. Absolutely. So timing is important here. I, I did say earlier that it's about having that follow-up contact with people after they've visited you. So you ne if they've signed up to your mailing list or your wine club, you need to have a first contact with them quite quickly to say thank you and this is the way it's going to work. And because we know that people are going to consume the wine they've bought with you that day, anywhere between three and nine months later, you can structure your wine clubs or your contact with people to coincide with those, uh, with that timing. Um, do you use a, are you a commitment club or uh, just a uh, and, and, and We actually allow a lot of flexibility and it works 
um, best for us. But while we're on that subject, I just want to touch, most wine clubs would probably work through the online shop. And um, I would also just urge uh, seller doors to check regularly that their online shop is actually functional. You would be, uh, I buy wine actually quite a lot from other seller doors, and you would be amazed how many times the, um, the online shop is not working mm -hmm. Or the process of going through to the sale is so difficult and hard that you just give up. And Especially yeah. when you're competing against online retailers like a Dan Murphy. Exactly. She's incredibly easy and works all the time. Exactly. Because they have the staff to maintain. In fact, what I would recommend to Celador owners, which we do, twice a year we buy wine from ourselves. So we actually be the customer, yeah, go in, go right through to the check in the credit card details, all that, and that process actually has helped us refine our online shop to make it more intuitive and user friendly. Um, yeah. So in fact, I heard of a winery once that hadn't had any sales for their online shop for six months, oh. and it was simply because it wasn't working. Oh, yeah, it wasn't mm. working. Do you do a similar thing at Mystery Shopping yourself at all? Do you send people in to check it out? No, because I trust my stock. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Okay, so I know we're, we're getting towards uh, the end of time here and we need to be able to ask some questions. Um, so, yep, next one. <laughs> so, the thing I want to really leave you with and to encourage you to do is to really think differently, as Steve Jobs would put it. There's a lot of sameness and similarity out there in our cellar doors, but interestingly, and uh, there's, there's also a lot of fantastic new experiences coming on stream, and I would encourage you all to consider how you can do something a little bit different and outside the square. I'll take a quote here from the, uh, the National Wine and Food Tourism Strategy from 2012 where what we really need to focus on is offering compelling, high quality wine and food tourism experiences that really reflect our distinctive attributes, exceed our visitor expectations and demand attention. Certainly Mark's given you some ideas today about how they go about doing that. So how are you going to go about doing that too? What's something different that you can do, different to your neighbours, different to uh, experiences that are available in your region? I think we've got a little bit of time left for questions. Two minutes. We've got, got two, two minutes. minutes. All right. So Get your questions I'm going to hand quickly. over to Anne to uh, open up for questions and uh, we'll answer them as quickly as we can. Of course, if you want to engage afterwards, because it's really difficult in these uh, webinars to focus on all of the things, and there's a lot of material in this uh, presentation, I'm really happy to uh, answer questions offline afterwards for you. All right, so Paul S has a, a, well, a question that's pertinent to everybody really. How do we attract more visitors? <laughs> uh, Paul, I assume you mean to your cellar door. Um, first of all, we've got to get them to our regions. So we've got to get them out of the cities and into the regions. And to do that, we need to offer compelling experiences uh, across the regions that people actually want to travel for. So there's a lot of collaborative effort that needs to be done there. Um, if, uh, if within your cellar door itself, as we've been alluding to, it's all about the experiences that you actually offer. What is it that's different to a standard cellar door tasting and how can you promote that? So for Mark, Chocovino is what he leads with. It's not all that uh, Handel's Winery does, but it's certainly uh, his, his hallmark, his uh, reason for people to want to go there in the first place. Um, we've also got another question in relation to wine club metrics. Um, Ian asks, is there a source for wine club metrics that we can reference? Uh, there's not a lot, no. There's, there's they, been very little done on wine club. I think Peter, how do you say it? <laughs> Macatane? Macatane. Say it again? Uh, I think it's Macatane. <laughs> yeah, Pete, uh, Peter <laughs> McAthamony, I think that's his. Uh, right. He's actually an, uh, he's, uh, very skilled with Wine Club, and his business is Wine Business Solutions. They could contact him mm -hmm. and um, get advice from him. Is there a sweet spot bottle price, price point? This is the other question that we had that was really interesting. Well, our, our cheapest wine is $23, um, but yeah, so I'd say between $23 and $30 is probably 
uh, over thirty dollars, it's got to be a um, it's you know, it's, it's, it's got to be a quality uh, wine with a pedigree. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really difficult question to answer because it really depends on uh, your your brand, your suite of products, and also your region. So Mark's talking, of course, uh, from the Adelaide Hills, which is a premium wine region, and there just really aren't cheap wines in a region like that. Uh, some of the other regions may happily have wines that are that are cheaper. I think there is, it's all about value and there's value to be had at every price point. So it really does come down to your own brand philosophies and, uh, and what it is that you're offering. All right, well I think that that, and yes, Bev, perhaps a webinar for wine club structure would be a good idea. I think that that's an excellent idea and we'll definitely look into that one. Um, Thanks so much for everybody for joining us today. If you would like more information, we've got, hopefully you're seeing a screen um, that will tell you how you can get more information. But um, from my perspective, Agua has a research and development newsletter. The research on which Robin based the presentation today is done by Johan Brewer. And all of our research gets advertised through that newsletter. If you would like an understanding of what research is coming out, when Johan's report is coming out, sign up to that e-newsletter. Um, and also what we would like you to do and what would be really appreciated is if you did our exit survey. Um, so if you think that this has provided value, if that you think that we can better this performance in any way, uh, please let us know. Um, apart from that, thank you so much for your time and we look forward to seeing you at the WCA next webinar or seeing you in inverted commas in December. Thanks very much.